Great. Uh, good evening. Yeah, Welcome. Exactly. Let me try this again. Good evening. Oh, good. Oh, no, no response. No? Good evening? Good evening. Okay. Uh, welcome. My name is Jordan Camp. I'm director of research here at the People's Forum, and I'm really delighted to welcome you um, this evening to the launch of Lana D. Pavitz's book, Stirrings, How Activist New Yorkers Ignited a Movement for Food Justice, which is published by the University of North Carolina Press. And I wonder if my friends in the cafe could just um, uh, keep it down a little bit um, for the purpose of this event. I should also let everyone know that uh, the event is being live streamed, so just know that when we have the question and answers and so on that, uh, you know, you should pose your questions with the understanding there's an audience not only in the room, but uh, around the country um, and the world. Uh, we're thrilled to um, co-host this event with the University of North Carolina Press, and we, this is a part of a series that we're working on with the UNC. Um, so thanks to Brandon Poya for that partnership. It started with Kianga Yamada Taylor's new book, The Race for Profit, and so we're thrilled to have stirrings. Um, before I introduce this evening's panel, I want to draw your attention to a few upcoming events. This is a part of a spring lecture series that I host here at the People's Forum called Interpreting the Crisis. And I am hoping that my clicker is going to work. If not, in a couple of weeks, we will have an event with Jody Dean to discuss her new book, Comrade, out from Verso Books. Um, and <laughs> We will then, on February 29th at 6.30, uh, Barnard Professor Christina Heatherton will discuss how to make a dress, domestic labor, internationalism, and the radical pedagogy of Elizabeth Catlett, which is really powerful for us because we have an Elizabeth Catlett art room uh, downstairs, and she'll explain her significance and her vision. Next slide. Uh, on March 13th, we're thrilled to host a talk by Mary Louise Patterson about the book that she co-edited, Letters from Langston, the Langston being Langston Hughes, which is out from the University of California Press. And then uh, we also will be hosting a talk about the common wind and Atlantic history from below from the historian Julius Scott, who will be in dialogue with the historian Marcus Rudiker. And then just one last slide. You can find all this information uh, on our website peoplesforum.org. This is just a small uh, slice of the talks uh, as a part of the lecture series. We also have classes uh, and events, but please do you know, check them out and uh, mark your calendars. We'd love to see you um, back. And so last but not least, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, our discussion tonight of stirrings. I will introduce uh, our speakers and then turn it over to them. Kim Phillips Fine. To my left is uh, a historian who, who teaches at New York University. She's the author of Fierce City, New York's Fiscal Crisis and the Rise of Austerity Politics, out from Metropolitan Books and Invisible Hands, The Businessman's Crusade Against the New Deal, out from W.W. W. Norton. Kathy Goldman, at my far left, at the end of the table, is a longtime community activist who's been working on food, hunger, and poverty issues since 1965. Uh, in 1980, she founded the Community Food Resource Center, now part of the Food Bank for New York City, and served as the executive director until 2003. With longtime collaborator, Agnes Molnar, she co-founded the Community Food Advocates Incorporated. Goldman's advoca advocacy work has focused on federal food programs, what? such as school lunch and breakfast and supplemental nutrition assistance programs, SNAP. Lana D. Povitz in the middle is a visiting professor of history at Middlebury College. Her research and teaching focuses on U.S. social movements, grassroots politics, women and gender, oral history, and food politics. Along with Stephen High, she's the co-editor of a special forthcoming issue of social history on activist lives. She received a Ph.D. in history from New York University in 2016, and her work has been supported by the social science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the Mellon Foundation, and the New York Council of the, 
for the humanities. And let me just say that we have copies of the book available. Aya, can you raise your hand there? Yes, here. Um, I really hope that you'll purchase a copy. I am certain that Lana would be willing to sign a copy uh, after. It also helps us to continue doing these kinds of events. So please do uh, help support the People's Forum by purchasing a copy of the book, supporting the press, supporting the author, and continue supporting events where we give free public programming. Um, so I feel welcome. and. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. Great. So, um, so I think what we're going to do is I'm going to start out by saying a few words about the book, framing it a little bit for people who might not have had a chance to read it yet. And then we'll open up to a kind of Q&A with um, Kathy and Lana. So. There's kind of an echo behind me um, of myself. But I, <laughs> I, I would start out by saying this is a, this is a beautiful and powerful book. Um, it is both a, it is, is a work of, of, a major work of historical scholarship, but it also, in a way, is a lens into, uh, it, it is a book that has a, a, a strong artistic and literary quality to it and which manages to be both about its stated subject, its arguments, and also, in a way, something more than that, I think. Um, it's a book about food and politics, but it is also really a book about hunger and about the kinds of hunger that politics both awakens in people and sometimes has the capacity to satisfy. It approaches food in the largest sense as a question of social justice, as a tool of political organizing, as a site of meaning and desire, and as a way that people come together, um, and as, a, as, as something that has the capacity to unify people, both in a particular moment and also in a larger cause. So the book chronicles the history of four different food organizations in New York City, in the kind of late 60s through the 90s, early 2000s. Um, the organizations being United Bronx Parents, um, the uh, Community F Food Resource Center, the Park Slope Co-op, and God's Love We Deliver, a organization that focused on delivering meals to people with AIDS during the 1980s. And in each of these close case studies of the different organizations and their, uh, their efforts around school lunch, around health care and food, around food and poverty, around school breakfast, um, Lana explores the dynamics, both the, the role that food played in these organizations and also the kind of the, the movement culture that grew up around food politics. And one of the arguments of the book, or one of the stated arguments of the book, is that food, in, cer in certain ways, this, this history, and, and, and frequently the way people see New York and the trajectory of New York City history from the 60s, late 60s to the present, is as a story, um, you know, as a kind of trajectory of decline of a certain kind of activist politics and culture. And you talk in the book a bit about how um, the sort of the transformation of nonprofit culture and the way that what starts out as a more grassroots and political uh, impulse turns into a more anodyne um, world of service provision that has lost some of its radical and militant edge. And that is, I think, part of the trajectory that you outline in the book. But what is, I think, remarkable of the book is you tell this story, but also give a sense. It, it is not a, um, a story of decline, or it's not a depressing trajectory either because there is a way in which, in telling the story of each of these organizations deeply, you make clear, the book makes clear, the impulse, the radical impulse that s sustains even in what is an increasingly conservative political climate. So it manages to both be about um, a, a kind of activism in hard times, hope in dark times, and what the kinds of things that manage to sustain that. Um, I'm going to say just kind of two more things about the accomplishment of the book, um, and then one sort of more personal reflection about it. So I think there are two other kind of key um, interventions, or, or, or the, the, the sort of the, 
the scholarly apparatus of what, what the book is doing. And I think the book is a major contribution to thinking about the history of the new left and its aftermath. And, um, and kind of a lot of histories of activism at this moment are ones that focus on Again, kind of a story of decline, the radical hope of the 60s ending or kind of dissipating and becoming somehow yuppie culture in the 80s. And I think your, the book really challenges this and shows a sustained trajectory that goes on. And you do that partly through the idea of kind of activist genealogies and connections between people that, um, sorry about that, the way that, that the, the, these organizations um, often led by women have a, um, they, 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 they don't, um, they, they, you, you talk about the idea of charisma in these organizations and that it's not a kind of dominant, the idea of charisma is so often associated with a certain kind of male leadership. You tell the story of organizations that are sustained by a very different kind of leadership and by female friendship and its centrality and its political importance. Something that I think, I've really never read a book that, or thinking of the accounts of the new left, things like James Miller's Democracy is in the Streets, where is female friendship in that story? It is, it's, this is a, a story of this political moment that puts those connections between women at the heart and front of center of what is happening. And I think by doing so, you see a story that's much less one of rise and decline and much more deeply one of sustained engagement that, that goes on even in the face of defeat. And it's not only defeat, that's also able to win meaningful political changes. Um, so I think that's another major accomplishment of the book and it, its contribution to the world of writing about 20th century American history. And then finally, I, I, I would say something about you. you it, the, the book um, draws deeply on oral histories. And there's many people who Lana has interviewed who are here tonight. Yeah. Um, and I think you, at the, the, meth the end of the book has a brief reflection, an essay on oral history as a uh, kind of ro the, the role of oral history in scholarship and the particular kind of oral history that Lana has worked on. Um, and you know, frequently when people do oral histories, it's an interview, you go in, you do the interview, and you leave. But you talk about how the relationships that came out of that for you and the way that they, are part, they became part of your intellectual um, infrastructure in writing the book. And I think it, that, uh, that I'd like to talk to more about it tonight, but I think that description of um, the role of emotional engagement and connection in doing intellectual work, just like in doing political work, is something that scholars rarely talk about and, and theorize about with as much sophistication and um, resonance as you do here. So I, I guess the last thing that I'll say about this is that I, I actually have been thinking about Lana's book a lot this fall um, as I, I have a son in pre-K um, who started pre-K in the universal pre-K program this year. And as he kind of got used to going to pre-kindergarten, um, one of the things that he's been especially fond of is the free breakfast at his school. Free at his school, as at this point, in any um, New York City public school. And I had there been many mornings upon kind of getting him there. Um, you know, often anybody who has tried to get a small child to go to school knows that it's not always the easiest of trajectories in the morning between getting up and getting out the door and getting into the school. And there have been many mornings sitting at the tables um, in the cafeteria, uh, surrounded by the extraordinarily kind cafeteria and food workers um, who kind of tolerate us lingering there a little bit longer than might otherwise, um, you know, than, than might be easiest for everybody. Um, and, and as he kind of dips his pancake into the maple syrup or eats the um, kind of cut up bits of apple and sips the juice, um, I have wondered how, I, I have marveled at this. This has seemed to me a quite remarkable and moving thing to have present, um, this sense that somebody actually cares about feeding your child. Um, and that it's not just one's own responsibility to do it, but that there is some way in which the city of New York or the school or whatever it is has taken it upon itself to help in that 
um, daily endeavor. Mm -hmm. So I think, I, and I, I have marveled at it and thought, where did this come from? And then I thought, aha, I actually know <laughs> yeah. where it came from, thanks to Lana's work. Um, so um, I think we'll, I'll, I'll wrap up my remarks there and uh, turn to the panel. And I thought, um, Lena, I thought maybe could you just start out by saying a little bit about where the book came from for you and how you arrived at the topic, how you started working on it. Sure. Can everyone hear me? Yes? It's good. Closer. How about now? It's okay. First of all, I just have to say thank you so much for those comments. Um, you said all the things I would want someone to say about this book, um, particularly the words about friendship and what they have meant to political organizing has been, I think can't be overstated, so thanks for saying that. Also, thank you for being here, Kathy, and thanks everybody for coming. This is an amazing group of people to see before me. I'm very overwhelmed. Um, people who are in the book, people who have counseled me, my family, uh, my friends, I mean, every, thank you for coming. Um, how I got started with the project. I came to NYU because I, I wanted to work with Linda Gordon, and I, who's here, and I was interested in social movement history generally, and I was interested in food generally. Um, and I didn't really know, like most early PhD students, where that was gonna go. I eventually did a lot of reading and saw that a lot of the, the historical work about food was very top down, it was very much about federal government, big business, and there were not a lot of regular people um, in it, people who just took an interest or who were concerned, sort of activisty types. I couldn't really find them. So I started to read with an eye for other histories that were like that, that were sort of grassroots, uh, but they were not really about, about food and how change around food happened. So I kind of just wrote the book that I wish I had found while I was doing the readings. Um, and then the project really got serious when I went out for lunch one day with Jan Poppendieck, who's also here, a sociologist whose work I really admire. And she said, if you're going to write about food in New York City, you have to talk to Kathy Goldman. I was like, okay. And I sort of had remembered Kathy Goldman from Jan's work, because she had written a little bit about um, her in relation to uh, emergency food. So I emailed Kathy, I spent a lot of time on the email. Could we meet? She was like, yeah, sure, we'll meet. We met on a corner, and we just had a great talk, and I started to see as she talked about her life and all the different kinds of work she'd been involved in, you've been involved in, that uh, there was, histor there was a, a story, a narrative was there that I, I didn't think had been told. And then I started to think about all the other kinds of food activism that I could talk about. The Park Slope Food Co-op came to mind. I had just become a member. Um, so that kind of unfolded. And I, it was important to me to represent the variety of food activism that was happening, um, which maybe we can talk more about after. Um, well, actually, along those lines, I wondered if you could say a little more about, and this is, uh, well, I guess I have two different questions. Um, but could you say a little more about kind of the groups that you talk about in the book and the experience of writing about each. And then I'd like to ask something about kind of food politics today. So. Sure. Well, I guess for those who haven't read the book, and thank you for introducing the four organizations because that can be, I can start to ramble. So you, you summarize them very succinctly. I would say that the, the two organizations that you named first, United Bronx Parents and the Community Food Resource Center, which were ones Kathy was very involved in, uh, were very much organizing in relationship to the state. They were very concerned about making sure that the government kind of stayed true to its responsibilities to provide basic things for people. Um, and making sure that, those, that the programs and the things they did were high quality and sort of democratic. The other two groups, God's Love um, and the Co-op, were much more interested in sort of doing their own thing. They were very focused on kind of producing certain services for people. So in the case of the co-op, it was good food at low prices for working members, which they accomplished um, and still accomplish. And for God's love, it was to provide desperately needed nourishment to a group of people who, in terms of the larger social structures, had been really abandoned. So in the 1980s, people with AIDS had often been abandoned by their families, their churches, their jobs, the sort of government infrastructure was not present. So people were looking after each other. Um, 
So God's love was founded to sort of give regular people a way to be of service to people who were really sick uh, and who really sort of needed the care that a food, a meal could provide. So eventually I came to see that there were two different ways that I was, I was looking at food activism. There was a kind of state-focused way and there was a more privatized way. But then, of course, it blurs, especially as you get into the 80s and 90s when um, austerity kind of brings lefty progressive activist types into the social service providing sector, which was really something I didn't anticipate to be writing about. Um, so that people who wanted to be focusing on changing, um, you know, on structural change, upstream solutions, making sure that the welfare checks people could live on, making sure that there were food stamps in place, good school programs, those same people kind of became pulled into service provision work, um, founding food banks, soup kitchens, um, sort of model programs, which they were very successful in doing, but they kind of took up the private sector's work to a certain extent. Great. Well, along those lines, just building off of that, um, would you, Lana, or I don't know, Kathy, you might like to speak to this as well. How, where do you see food politics in New York today? Or how do you think, um, you know, what has happened to food, to food politics and organizing around food in the city now? Really, you should take that question. That's the <laughs> toughest question. <laughs> I really don't know what to say about it because we're in the midst of a potentially very radical moment of change, radical to the right, not to the left. And uh, what happens now is going to have a big impact just to give you a I'm sure most of you have seen in the newspapers that the Trump administration has figured out that if you need to get food, you have to work for it. And if you don't work for it, they don't care if you starve. And to put it mildly, and it's like, you know, for some of us who, as you can see, I'm a bit older than the most of the people here, uh, I mean, it's, in the Reagan administration, they came up with the idea that they had to save money so they would make ketchup a vegetable. Now, some of you may have heard of that, and it became a very big deal. They would count the tomato in a package of, you know, the kind of thing you eat at lunch, and that was counted as a vegetable. And people went nuts. I'll tell you, it was really fascinating. People just couldn't understand it. It, it, it actually drove them crazy. First of all, the people who saw this, who said, are you kidding? This is impossible. But it led people to really realize what was going on. And it's the same kind of thing that's happening now. You don't have a job, you can't get a job, too bad you can't get food stamps. So I don't know where we're going. If anybody does, I'd be very interested in uh, <laughs> knowing it in advance mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. I would just, I can add, not that I have a strong idea, but I do think one thing we can be encouraged about is that there's a lot of people making common cause. So the food movement now knows it's a movement um, and is trying to be forming r solidarity relationships with so many other kinds of organizing work. And I think that's important because it's all the same fight. You know, the fight for s sufficient food stamps is the same as the ability to afford housing, which is the same as the ability to be represented, you know, democratically. These are all related. So I think that there's a, a stronger intensity of working together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's helpful. I think without that, food justice would not really be possible in a meaningful way. I don't know if you'd agree with that. I don't know. How do you think about the, I mean, there's also been this other revival of interest in food or kind of issues around food and um, kind of individual consumption and its connection to things like climate change or eating, I, mean, I think a lot of times people talk about eating ethically. They are talking now about their own individual food practices and how they fit in, especially with environmental politics. Um, yeah. Do you, do you want to speak to that? 
I, I think the thing with that is individual consumption is really important, but we also really need to be thinking about what's often called upstream solutions. So, you know, paying people a living wage, making sure that workers are part of unions if they, you know, if they want to be, um, making sure that there's a health and safety uh, organization that, overse that oversees safety, that it's not, it shouldn't just come down to individual people voting with their dollars, because if you don't have those dollars, you can't really participate in political change, and that's not, um, that's not a message that moves me, and I think that too much focus on individual dietary things is kind of the wrong conversation to be had. I do think that with, you know, the Sanders campaign, and there's just a lot of attention to um, those upstream sort of economic change ideas right now, which I'm encouraged by. Could you talk a little bit more about your ideas about oral history and its role in writing the book and how you, um, kind of how you went about building these, you know, kind of developing relationships and, um, yeah, how, how you used it? Yeah, sure. Well, I had always intended to do oral history because I much prefer reading books that have characters in them. I much prefer to see the humans come alive on the page, and it was important to me to try to do that. So I, I had planned to do some version of that, but I didn't have any training in oral history, really. Mm -hmm. I had supportive mentors at NYU, but I didn't have a kind of training in ethics and um, ongoing consent and all these practices that I now know oral historians use. But I did have a lot of curiosity, and I think that one thing I did write is I sort of just approached the interviews with a couple of really key questions that I just wanted to talk over. And I felt like a lot of the relationships that I developed with my narrators unfolded from that curiosity. So, I mean, Kathy is, you know, ha has played a big role role in the story. I mean, she's done a lot of things for many years, but I think that to have meaningful oral histories, you need two people for that. You also need narrators who are willing to engage and give you their time and tell you their stories. So I just got, I got lucky in a lot of ways. I think partly I asked good questions and showed that I was serious and cared, and partly I, there were a lot of amazing people who had a lot of great stuff to talk about and maybe just had not been treated as history before, <laughs> which is, I don't know how that was for you, but um, I think I also just will say it, I'm glad it came out in the book, but for me, I was living in New York. It was important to me. I, I wanted a richer experience as someone who was living here. I wanted to really understand where I was, and when I spoke to people and they would tell me these stories, you know, I almost got mugged driving a taxi over here, or, you know, this is where I would sit outside and talk to my friend for hours, you know, I, like, I st the city started to come alive for me uh, because of these conversations that I was having. Whereas if I was doing the kind of oral history that was just a one-off, right. I wouldn't have had that. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think you, you know, part of what the book does and I, is the oral history has also helped to create a different kind of archive and people share different kinds of papers and resources with you oh, as yeah. well. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah well, I would just say to that, but well. But there's also that you kind of, um, just to, this is a theme running through the whole book too, that uh, transformation or uh, the transformation of the people involved is a major part of any political project. Not just whatever policy goal is won at any particular moment in time, mm -hmm. but actually the way that the people who participate in it, that their lives are, are reshaped by that. And that that is um, part of what politics is and generating people who are willing or able to, uh, who, who kind of conceive of their lives as part of that, uh, as part of political movements is, it, is itself a kind of victory or part of what politics, so it's interesting to hear you talk about your own transformation in the process of writing the book. Yeah, I think there are two things here. For one thing, and I, I guess I've said this before and maybe in the book too explicitly, but I kind of think that under austerity, when vict tangible material campaign victories are very hard to come by, they often are fleeting, sometimes they can be undone, that the kind of personal payoff of being involved in, in social change work is really important. Um, that if you feel that you're learning things about how the world really works, or you're developing relationships with people who share your values, or you're seeing yourself being part of something larger, that whole process is really, really, is more important now than ever, I think. Um, so there is that, that's very true. I also felt that I, 
something that helped me write the book and do the oral histories was the fact that I was also an activist. I, I saw myself that way, not a food activist, but I have been very involved with Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, and there was some overlap to some extent. People you know, are only one or two degrees removed from everything here. Mm -hmm. So I ended up learning, sort of both were enriching each other. The kinds of questions I had about social change work now often had a lot of overlap with the things people were talking about 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago in some ways. So that was also really rich. Well, I guess I have just two more questions and maybe we can open it up. And, one, and um, I actually, Kathy, I was wondering if you wanted to say anything about what it's like to read about yourself in history. Or what is it like to be a historical, <laughs> the subject of a historical monograph, <laughs> a historical book? <laughs> That's a very hard question yeah. to answer. In, on the serious side, it so happens that the number of people who really worked together in the various operations that we developed and so on, uh, many of them are no longer on the planet. And it's a very difficult thing to, uh, when you think about all the wonderful things that they did, uh, or pushed us to do, or whatever you want to, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, it's very, very difficult. I'm 88, in case anybody cares. Uh, so it's it's a it's a complicated question. It really is. If I think of anything smarter to say later, I'll say it. <laughs> um, and then I guess my last question is for Atlanta. What do you? What are your favorite things to cook, or do you see your own <laughs> food practices cook, as political yeah. at all? Right, <laughs> and this is maybe a leading question with cooking in particular. Well, do you know that I love to cook? Yes. Yeah, well, I do love to cook. Um, it brings me great comfort and joy, and um, it relaxes me to cook. I, I come from a long line of amazing cooks, my mother and my grandmother. Um, and certainly I've always really known that food is a way of bringing people together to sit down together and a way of putting people at ease and of sharing something. And that's been very true for me. I don't think of that as political, to be real. I'm much more, folk I'm, as I said before, with the critique of individual consumption and that focus, I mean, I do try to shop at the you know, co-op in Vermont, which is local and organic and all these things, and I miss the Park Slope Food Co-op daily because I loved having that, um, those kinds of connections in my life. And the, the being part of a project like a co-op where I felt like I was building something. I, had, I was part of a, a well-oiled machine at this point that was for the good, like it was working in a way that I thought was good for the world. That felt kind of political, but I don't really see the big political fights um, in those terms. Mm -hmm. yes. Do you? like to cook or, did, or, did, or see the truth. Well, I guess I just, I, I don't think, I guess I would say I don't see your, your, uh, your, in, your I don't see your, um, I, I do think that there's something, well, I, 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 I do, I, I think there may in fact be something political about your love of cooking and your um, willingness to, to, uh, to cook for people. Yeah, um, I mean relationships no, including, are political. Yeah. So, so I, yes. I, I, and, and maybe even a, a way of, um, of building reciprocity and connection um, in academic settings and academic relationships that often are not like that. And Definitely. so, I, so I, 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 you know, I, so I think there is a politics to it, maybe more than, uh, than, than you suggested there. Um, that could be, that's yeah. Good. <laughs> so I, I, let, let's open up and see if, if people have questions um, or, or Oh. Let me, you, you can moderate, Lena. I have a question for I Kathy. Think. So Kathy, so you've, Kathy, so you've been in the movement forever. Sorry, the lights are a little. Oh, and we're sitting here together at this moment of national cataclysm. And I list with, I'm interested to know what you think we've done wrong that's brought us here, based on your experience in the movement. wrong, it's these other people that did it, not us. <laughs> right. I mean, come on. What did you do ever in your life that would bring on this kind of nonsense that's going on? It's crazy. 
Because people are. But I, I'll tell you what's bothering me more than that is that we've talked now for what, maybe 10, or 10 minutes, or I have no idea. Uh, and we haven't mentioned the word poverty. And that is one of the main things that talks about food because people just don't have it mm -hmm. if they don't have the money for it. We, if, if you don't mind my saying, it's, we live in a, in a time when you can walk out this door or stay in here for that matter and there's food everywhere, but you have to be able to pay for it. And if you can't, you suffer a great deal. And that is a, what really pushed so many of us into doing something very serious about it. Now, how, what, whether we, there's always an argument about, well, if instead of that, you did something, maybe we wouldn't have these idiots doing what they're doing to uh, our world. But it's not, I don't believe that. I think you have to take care of people. When they, when they need food, you better do something to get the food to them if they can't just walk out and buy it. And if, so there's, it's a complicated issue. And I think I've walked past what I was. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Um, so congratulations on your book. My question is, since you started with breakfast, so the first thing I thought of was the Black Panthers Breakfast for Children program, which also raises for me the question of, in your book, which I obviously haven't read yet, do you get to the issue of how do the food movements challenge state power and challenge a system like what you were just talking about, Kathy, like structurally how the organizing goes to that whether there have been any significant wins in that and how that has evolved, if it has. Yeah, I, I would, hi Laura, thanks. I think to a great extent the book is about the different ways that people try to win concessions from the state. I think that the Black Panthers, um, who I write about in, in one chapter, probably pose the best threat. Like I think, and there's the most evidence that especially in California particularly, that um, they were really threatened by what the Panthers were able to achieve with their free breakfast programs. For those who don't know, probably most of you here do know, that the Panthers across the country were organizing free breakfast programs for children um, and kind of also sharing a certain politics with them as they did it. So it was very powerful propaganda in a way, and I mean that in the best sense. Uh, and the state officials, the FBI, people were all over trying to shut this down because it was threatening to the status quo. It proved that people could be fed for very little money and that it, it was done and the reason, or that it could be done. And the reason it wasn't being done was a lack of political will. So definitely, the, I'm glad you, always good to mention the Panthers. And I mean, the other ways that we looked at that um, were more about what advocates did often in the city level to improve, well, to, to win free breakfast, to win for everybody, to win uh, school food for everybody, which has recently, only recently become uh, a victory, but thanks to these efforts started 50 plus years ago. Uh, and then the ongoing work every minute from advocates and organizers all the time, never letting that fight go. It takes a lot of time to achieve things, especially when the state is involved. Do you wanna add to that? Well, just to back to the bre breakfast program, um, it, the truth is that what happened from, because the Panther program was city, uh, countrywide, and I know it was a big deal in the, uh, in the West Coast, but people don't realize, I mean, we had it, we were supporting their effort, and the, just to put it bluntly, it was so successful that the state, that is the United States, had to start their own breakfast program for children. There's no question that there is a major connection between what the Panthers were forcing to happen and what actually, what we now have, which is breakfast for 
children in New York City, free breakfast for every child regardless. Nobody asks any questions about how much money you have and all the rest of it, which is unbelievable to me, given what the way it was before. But you, you, and you have to constantly mention the fact that it's free and so is lunch and mm -hmm. any kid is just in school and it includes parochial schools and other schools too, by the way. But that's the kind of thing that happened. But in the case of breakfast, the Panthers started it. And then four, four women in New York City, two of whom are here, uh, really made it happen so that we now have this kind of a breakfast program. So it tells us, also gives us some hope in many ways that you can really do something and to me the ba main thing is stick with it, stay with it, don't go away from it, learn more about it. it you know, I mean, it, it sounds very much cliche and all of that, but honestly, I really believe that if you don't let it alone, if you just keep bothering it, if you keep forcing the issue, Something's gonna happen, something's gonna give. Strange things happen, very strange things. <laughs> a bunch of black major radicals started giving breakfast to kids and look what we've got now. So. Thanks. I saw Jan had a question. Jan does not. She does. Your about your transcripts and any other archival material you might have collected. Activists are notoriously busy people, and they often don't get around to writing their memoirs or don't feel that it's, uh, anyone would be interested or what have you. So one of the reasons I was so excited when you took this on was because there was gonna be a record of what I thought was really important work. So are any parts of what you collected accessible to new young scholars coming along? Oh man, thanks Jan. Uh, they ought to be all accessible. I would say right now they're certainly accessible if you ask me. They're not in an archive yet. Um, we do, we were starting, I mean Kathy's papers are at uh, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies along with Ellen Lurie's papers and Evelina Antonetti's papers and a whole host of other important activists from the 60s. So Kathy's interviews I think are not there yet, but um, all of her papers are, and that transfer from her home archive to the official archive has been amazing. <laughs> she would sometimes have stuff and be like, oh, do, you, do you think anyone would want this? I was thinking of getting rid of it. I'd be like, no, someone wants it. Don't get rid of it. Um, I, do need, it <laughs> I do need to come up with a way of systematizing um, the 43 interviews I've collected. I also have checked in, and but would check in again with the people with whom I did the interviews just to make sure that they do want them on the public record. But if anybody here is Loki an archivist and like wants to work with me to sort of deposit those, that would be great. And I'm very open to doing it and I'm, I would love for these things to be shared. I do have all of the audio. I don't have most of them transcribed. Although Kathy's apparently are being transcribed. Right? Yep. You're Anyway, they're available. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Roz. Oh, it's so wonderful to do this. And I'm so proud and happy to know you and can't wait to read the book, Lana, and love hearing Kathy's wisdom. Um, this is a weird question, but given, and notwithstanding the importance of the Panthers, but given the importance of women, women's friendships, women's connection to food, would you call this a feminist story, in a way? Would we call this a feminist story? I call it that all the time. <laughs> and, and would yeah. you say why? Yeah, I, do you want to say first? I think it is. I think it, the whole issue of food is a, a women's issue. I really do. I mean, I'm not saying to exclude men, but uh, I think the people who come to this kind of thing because of a great need are women. And I mean, I'm gonna tell a story that's in the book, is that all right? Sure. 
So uh, at one point, the Board of Education in New York City was carrying on about sex education and other things, and it, no matter what was going on, they wouldn't listen to the parents. And one woman got up, and because it was really fascinating that for women, they weren't afraid of the topic of food. You would get two people to come to a meeting on reading, and because we did a lot of things of that nature in the Bronx, and, but, I mean, if they, it was just unbelievable. People would come by the hundreds, literally, when it somehow was based on food. Because, and this one mother got up and said to the Board of Education, I know you're saying all this stuff and so forth and so on, but when it comes to sex and food, I know as much as you do. <laughs> and that was, stayed with me the rest of my life. It's in the book. <laughs> it is. So I think, obviously, food is a women's issue in that, like, who experiences hunger and poverty, overwhelmingly women, uh, who is normally tasked with caregiving work, including food, normally women. But I think it's also a feminist issue and a feminist story because of the way people valued each other, like that thing of taking relationships seriously. And this is not true in every minute of every story I told in the book, but by and large, it's the relationships that people have that really make the work, that makes it possible to be in it for 50 years. When you're working with people you respect and learn from, when you treat each other well and value that process, that's feminist. One more question? Will. Hi, Lana. Congratulations. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to contextualize this a little bit. I grew up uh, all f dependent on food services through charity, through churches. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, how, like, I feel like a lot of people grow up with that kind of um, aid to food access as opposed to the services or the organizations that you're talking about. So I was wondering, like, what was the situation with charity at the time? What kind of relationships do, like, food pantries from churches and stuff like that have to these organizations? Um, it's sort of a broad question, but I'm just, the, the, the idea of charity seems like an important one here. Yeah, well, the last two chapters of my book really deal with this, but the sort of growth of emergency food and food charity is really a phenomenon of the 1980s. It's, it's a product of Reagan and the cutting of the social safety net and the removal of a tax base, um, which pushed people into sudden need and then it sort of necessitated a direct and immediate response. So churches took the lead on that. They still do. I, I, I think it's important not to overstate the fact that federal money still pays for the vast majority of food programs, including uh, the kind of emergency food uh, that is given out by churches, often there's money that's coming from the state and federally to pay for that, also the result of advocacy. Um, but churches kind of are the immediate, like people in churches know community members in need, and so there's a lot of distribution networks already there. But it's also volunteer-based. It's often relying on people showing up. It's not... Um, it's often not being done in conversation with kind of structural change, which is a problem. Um, and as I talk a little bit about, as Jan Poppendick's work really also talks about in great detail, that the thing about charity is it, it kind of maintains a separation a lot of the time between us and them, the people who need and the people who give. And that's not politically um, helpful, doesn't, doesn't bring about major structural change. So I, I took a critical but understanding approach to the growth of charity. Do you want to add to that? It's a, it's a very, com I think you, carry, you really covered it. I mean, the main thing is that we are not trying, I don't think this network of people is trying to take away a government, something the government does. There should be you know, levels of earnings that are extremely important. If you don't have the earnings, everything changes. And you don't want, uh, you, you have to have 
these if these places you you must have them i mean i know this is something that uh, people and advocates have talked about for a long time it's complicated because you spend a lot of on energy running a good pantry or a good i mean you want to do it right you want to not have people feeling miserable when they come into a place and so forth and so on so it's a very complicated issue. It really is. Uh, you could. Uh, that could be the next book. Well, I, I just <laughs> want to say one final thing. I actually think that that is what the last chapter of the book is about. I mean, Kathy's organization, Kathy, Agnes, many people here, Community Food Resource Center, actually did that. Is that a sign? It's a sign. Just to say that sometimes um, it's possible to do direct service and advocacy work together. Um, and that that model should be expanded as much as possible. Because it doesn't have to be either or, it's been proven that both can enrich each other, that service provision work, direct aid, charity, can inform the strategies that advocates need to use. And advocates also, and, and you know, it kind of can be reciprocal. But it's, it's labor intensive for sure. I think we have time for one last question and then we should wrap up. Maureen? But in their like advocacy so in the 90s Kathy I remember there was the what they called the welfare reform network which was it was really we were trying to respond to the wealth all the deleterious impacts of welfare reform and, and a leading group was community food resource center and um, Liz Kruger and you know they did really good work on the other hand I went to a lot of those meetings and most of and I'm not saying nonprofits don't do some good work. Most of the organizations were nonprofits. And a lot of us know about the nonprofit industrial complex and how activism is often stymied or limited by being part of the nonprofit industrial complex. So I'm wondering how you thought that movement around that time that Community Food Resource Center was involved with, which my recollection was, because I was at a lot of those meetings, was heavily run by non some grassroots groups and then not like but how how do you think that what do you think the impact of that was uh, the impact of nonprofits well, there, there, that movement, I'm just saying a lot of the movements that I remember like in the welfare reform network there were other movements also at the time but there was still because so much of our activism in the last 20 30 years is dominated by nonprofits but how did the domination of nonprofits impact or limit the work that was being done around this issue? Well, Liz Ackles could definitely answer this question better than I can, but I would, it seems to me that nonprofits in the 80s are a different animal than nonprofits now. That the way they've become so sleek and corporatized and brand conscious and messaging conscious has really limited the kinds of things they want to do or are able to do. I seem to know that the nonprofits like CFRC, like the Welfare Reform Network, they were kind of like ragtag a little bit. Like they, they kind of came together based on political affinity and they had particular projects that they did, but that was kind of the priority. It wasn't about like trying to fundraise all the time. I mean, they did a fair bit of that in certain contexts, but it wasn't about, you know, the, the needs that they were working on came first and then all the kind of funding worked around what their goals were. I think today that it's a bit different that a lot of the time people are, nonprofits are chasing big grants and major donors and it, it's sort of much more greased now in a way that sometimes the kind of um, activist fire kind of gets a bit lost. Um, you know, these nonprofits were holding, letting all kinds of groups hold meetings there. They were, um, doing a lot of coalition work in a serious, serious way, which a lot of nonprofits don't have time or capacities to do. So I just think it's important to be historical uh, when we're talking about nonprofits in the 80s and 90s, and even the early 2000s. Can I say something? Yeah, really say something. I just want to point out that uh, uh, because a number of people we had seem to know, Community Food Resource Center, which was a New York operation, but what started this whole business, as far as I'm concerned, is United Bronx Parents, which was an organization led by a remarkable woman named Evelina Antonetti. Her picture is in the book. 
and uh, she was a wonderful and amazing person. And how did she and why did she start an organization for parents? By the way, looking very often for fathers of kids to be coming, <coughs> be part of the parent uh, issue. She really did. But in any case, that organization started because she went, she took her five-year-old to school one day and then was called up because the, the five-year-old disobeyed the teacher and they suspended him. Now, I will say that it's forever wonderful that that happened in some ways. <laughs> not to, not to Danny, Donny, but <laughs> it was really the beginning of looking differently at schools and at what parents could do and should do and so forth. And it was a remarkable place. There's much written about it. I think it's terrific that it, it is. And in addition to that, it's really what what happened one day was that 10 Puerto Rican mothers came to see Mrs. Antonetti and they came to say that their children were, that they didn't have enough money to give their children lunch and they couldn't do anything because the food was so bad in the school that that something had to happen because they could not, they w couldn't have their children eating that stuff. And that was the beginning of where this came to, th where the food issue crossed with all of this kind of thinking and so forth. And it was just remarkable and it certainly changed many of our lives and changed what was made available to people and I, I wish uh, some of the advocates in the room would stand up because they're the <laughs> ones that are still carrying this on. And it is just, um, it would never have happened without Agnes continuing to work, without, uh, without Liz Ackles. Liz Ackles was able to bring many, many parents into this work and it, it's just absolutely amazing that th this has happened it's a, a great victory for poor people for all people it, it just is wonderful and uh, if Papa Dick didn't write those books that really showed the way in, in a few I mean it's it's really quite a wonderful story and a lot much of it is in the book of course and, but it's just uh, great to have, to see that something that started with a f handful of parents, very low income, barely speaking English, they brought their problems in Spanish, and these many years later, here we are with free meals for every kid, and it's, it's just wonderful. And it wouldn't have happened without, or I'm sure many of you in the room who I don't, I don't happen to know, but I'm sure you participated in some of the stuff around this. So we got to do it again. That's what <laughs> yeah. I just uh, want to encourage you again to, if you haven't already, to buy a copy of the book. Um, and I want to th thank the panel and ask you if you maybe join me in thanking the panel as well. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming.